the the networking that I did and the professors and mentors that I met have all led to this point. I didn't realize you had an MBA. I'm curious, just from an entrepreneurial point of view, this is, this is going to sound half like a really silly question, but I mean it sincerely because most people I meet don't have the traditional education behind it. They just have, let's say, vision and passion. So if you were going to do it all over again, would you still get your MBA? So this business wouldn't exist without my MBA. Huh? Um, and so I, I would go back and do it again. And I, you know, I'm sitting on, you know, a, a large amount of debt from school, uh, but it's still worth it. And the main reason was the the networking that I did and the professors and mentors that I met have all led to this point. Um, our first round of investment was through WashU Venture Network um, wow. here in St. Louis. Um, we had a, a second round that was also uh, it was a debt round and it was through the, the same same network here in St. Louis. So um, I, I would do it again. Okay. Um, and a, a lot of it is because, I mean, the, the core honeymoon, we're trying to change the, the chocolate industry by having a honey sweetened product. And I always wanted to take a look at, you know, what, what, what is at the core of what capitalism is and, and how, how this business operates. Um, how can we have a, a change in, in outlook, um, for, for the better, and what, what, what a better way to do it than to go into the heart of a, a you know, high, high ranking uh, business school and see what all these business professionals are learning. Um, and that was, that, that was the, the way that I kind of dove, dove into my, my degree is um, a, a bit of a different view than all of my other classmates is how, how can I do this, but in a, in a different light. I love that. Gosh. Um, so I, I feel like, so much press covers your origin story about the, the two college students making chocolate in their dorm kitchen. Is there any part of that story that doesn't get a lot of attention that you'd like to bring up any details to it only because it is such a beautiful open, mm -hmm. but um, because it's been over and over again shared, is there a part of that that doesn't get enough attention? I, I would just say, and it's, it's really exciting to share this. And, and I hope that others who want to start a business, you know, when, when you start off, it's not going to be great. It's not going to taste good. It's not, your product's not going to be incredible, but you just have to keep making it and create uh, in business school, we call the, the MVP, the minimum viable product. Um, how, how can you create something and, and keep pushing and be excited about it? And so, yeah, all of our chocolate tasted terrible. And, and some of our bars still aren't, you know, 10 out of 10, uh, mm -hmm. but we're, we're showing up every day and, that's one of the things I remind myself is just to show up every day and um, good, good things will happen. So um, yeah, for, from the beginning, uh, our product has been unique. It's been different, but it hasn't always been great. Mm. Uh, it probably doesn't, doesn't have to be great in the beginning. That's interesting. Uh, very recently over the fall, I was talking to a, a world-class distiller. He does gin and vodka and uh, probably eight bottles together. And that's something he brought up is if he were to make, a hundred flavors, which he does out of those hundred, 20 of them are okay. Like they're not horrible. And then 10 of the 20 are pretty darn good. And like three to five make it to market. And I don't know, are those numbers as far as, cause I don't know how many different chocolate flavors you do, but is it the same kind of funnel for you as far as a whole lot of less than good? And then they get better and better and better. And then you pick the, the best few flavors. Is that same idea? Same idea. So we have a, a couple different boxes of bars and origins, uh, be it uh, Guatemala or a random Peruvian origins that we tested all the way up to 100% cocoa, all the way down to 60%. Um, and sweetening with honey gives us this, this odd, um, this really fun sweet spot where you can make it at 85% and it'll taste completely different at 70%. And there is a sweet spot. There's a perfect percentage where it tastes, there's a perfect kind of symphony of, of sweetness and, and the cocoa, um, it all kind of plays at once. So um, yeah, I would say we definitely have a wide range of, of flavors and, and only only one typically wins. So, so for example, our 77% Uganda bar uh, is a good food award finalist. And um, 
at 77%, it's, it's exactly where we want it to be. But um, we had it at 90, we had it all the way down to 60. We tried making a milk chocolate with it. Um, we thought about putting raspberries on the back of it. Um, but yeah, um, there, there's, there, there, there's a great way to hone in on it. It's, it's a lot of trials and errors and also a lot of, a lot of taste, taste testing. The tasting, the taste testing part makes me smile because I can imagine it's both a lot of fun, but from a work point of view, maybe it gets old fast because it's a lot of chocolate to eat, but invite us over sometime for that part. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Um, <laughs> and I, everyone always asks, do you get tired of, of chocolate? And my answer is yes and no. Um, yes, because I, I now have, um, I, I've always had acid reflux, but chocolate doesn't always help that, especially dark chocolate. Mm -hmm. So that, that's whenever I get super tired of it, but no, because it's just, it, it's a wide range of flavor that it's always new. We once made a bar from uh, Guatemala that tasted like uh, sriracha. It was, and there was nothing else added, just cocoa and honey. Um, so yeah, um, it's, it, it can, it can be a, a, a lot of fun. 